If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus began to approach the towns where most of his mighty deeds had been done since they had not repented. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty deeds done in your midst had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would long ago have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And as for you, Capernaum, Will you be exalted to heaven? You will go down to the netherworld. For if the mighty deeds done in your midst had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. The Gospel of the Lord. You may have noticed I'm kind of messing around with the microphone here today. Uh, Jim Guyman, our unofficial staff tech person, right, uh, has put a little, uh, that way I don't have to move the microphone left and right. So very grateful for Jim and all that he does for us. Uh, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be hearing from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, the prophet Isaiah, it's always kind of interesting when this comes up during the daily mass lectionary because Isaiah is by far you know, the most famous of the prophets, perhaps one of the most important prophets of the Old Testament. It's one of the longest books of the entire Bible. Uh, Isaiah, after the book of Psalms, is the most quoted Old Testament book, right, in the New Testament. And it's always a little bit challenging when it comes up in daily Mass, how to approach discussing the prophet Isaiah in these readings. Uh, part of the issue is because uh, the church uh, does not share a lot of the most important readings because we already hear them during Sunday Mass, so the church doesn't want to repeat them. Also, I think, in my opinion, too, there's just, I don't know who was pick, picking these readings from the book of Isaiah, but oftentimes it seems like some of the passages chosen are kind of not very significant to the overall story of the prophet of Isaiah. So we'll see how this goes over the next couple of weeks, but what I'd like to do is just kind of give uh, an overview of who the prophet Isaiah was, what his historical context was, and some of the most important passages, not exactly the passages we're going to be reading from. Right? So Prophet Isaiah, right? just a little historical context for him. Right? So remember, put ourselves in the Old Testament timeline. Which, which part are we in here? Right? I was very affirmed yesterday. I was talking with Jeff Nelson. He was saying how he was in South Dakota for Mass last Sunday, and the priest gave the whole Old Testament context of who the Samaritans were, who the Levites were, and he said, man, it was awesome. Father Bowers in South Dakota, I knew exactly what he was talking about. We just talked about this through the prophet Hosea. Right, so remember I mentioned how the prophets Amos and Hosea, right, they were preaching up in the northern part of Israel, otherwise called Samaria or Ephraim or on occasion Joseph, right, representing the, the most important northern tribes. Right, those were the two prophets who preached in the north. Now the rest of the prophets throughout the scriptures, for the most part, are going to be living in the southern part of Israel, which we call Judah or Jerusalem or on very uh, seldom occasions, it's called Benjamin. Benjamin was the other tribe that stuck around. So Isaiah was living in the southern part of the kingdom, and he was living just before the time that the people of the north, just before they were going to be taken over by Assyria. Now Isaiah is not primarily focused on the northern part of the kingdom, other than the fact that the northern part of the kingdom, which we heard about today, right, wanted to make war with Judah. The people of Samaria were teaming up with the people of Syria, and they were basically going to attack Jerusalem and to attack Judah. And that's the only reason why Isaiah is interested in the north. He's primarily focused on the people in the south. And one of the things we're going to be hearing from him is how corrupt the people in Judah had become 
You remember last week when we were talking about Hosea, I kind of made a comparison between what happened in the days of Hosea to what happened during the time of the Protestant rebellion. Right? The people living in the South, even though they had the temple and the priesthood that God had established and all the different rituals and sacrifices, right? there was a lot of corruption. And so 10 of the tribes of Israel moved to the north, and the biggest issue they committed is that they established their own temple and their own priesthood. What we're going to see during the prophet Isaiah is we're going to have a better understanding of why people did that. It really was pretty terrible what was going on in the southern kingdom. Even at one point, people were offering child sacrifice right, in the southern part of the kingdom. Very dark days. Now, that's just a little bit of a historical context. All I want to talk about today is the calling of Isaiah, which is just before we read today. Today we heard from chapter 7. The calling of Isaiah is in chapter 6. And I want to talk about it because it's one of the most famous scenes from the scriptures that many of us are not really familiar with. And also something I think is a really beautiful passage. Basically, Isaiah was in prayer, right? He was receiving oracles from God. Right? And he basically had a vision of heaven. Right? Scholars debate whether or not he was taken up into heaven, like St. John in the book of Revelation or whether he saw a vision of heaven coming down. But basically, Isaiah found himself in the presence of God, in the heavenly temple. We know from the Bible that when they built the temple in Jerusalem, it was based off of God's heavenly temple in heaven. Right? Sometimes when we think about heaven, we don't really think about heaven in that way. But heaven is a temple. When we have mass here on earth, we are participating in the worship of heaven. So when the temple was built, it was based off of the heavenly temple. So Isaiah finds himself having a vision of the heavenly temple. And what he sees is God seated on a marvelous throne. And around that throne, there are six seraphim. We know what seraphim are? Seraphim literally means the burning ones. And so they're the angels of God who are around the throne of God all the time. And he sees six seraphim on either side of the throne of God. And what he hears those seraphim singing is, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of his glory, right? Exactly what we hear at Mass, right? Every time we have Mass, we sing that song. Again, it's recalling the song the angels sing around the throne of God. There's a reason why at Mass we sing that song and then everybody kneels, it's because we recognize it is at that point that heaven and earth have come together, and we are now in the presence of the communion of saints and the angels. And when Isaiah has this vision, he sees this, and of course he's awestruck at God's majesty and glory and power. And he falls on his face, as people tend to do in the Bible when they see the presence of God. And he says, Lord, I am a man of unclean lips, and I am from a people of unclean lips, basically saying, I am a part of a very wicked race, a very wicked nation. How can I even stand in your presence? Which I think is something really beautiful for us. I think that's the kind of experience that people should have when they come to Mass. We should be in awe and trembling of the majesty and power of God. It's one of the great tragedies of so many modern churches and the way that we do modern worship. It seems like that reverence seems to be lost in our modern church. But Isaiah sees us and he's struck by the power and majesty of God. And he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And what happens is one of the seraphim takes a burning coal and places it in the mouth of Isaiah. And basically the imagery is Isaiah all of a sudden becomes clean and worthy. God Isaiah hears God speaking, and God says, Who shall I send to my people to preach to them? Right? And Isaiah, Isaiah responds, Here am I, Lord. Right? Send me. I right? know that famous song from the Gather Hymnal many of us know, right? Here I am, Lord. Right? That comes from the prophet Isaiah. It comes from this very story. Right? I just think it's, a, it's a really important for us to recognize that. Then when the prophet Isaiah is called, the first thing he recognizes is how unworthy he is. 
and is only by the grace of God that he is made worthy of the mission. It's kind of a great imagery of what every Mass is like. At every Mass, we should be struck by the majesty and glory of God and be struck by our unworthiness. And yet, miraculously, through communion, right, we receive God into our bodies. Right? So many people receiving communion on the tongue. Right? There's a connection with this imagery of Isaiah, that this coal was placed on his tongue. Right? Kind of a prophetic foreshadowing of the Eucharist. All these things can influence the way we pray, the way we approach the Mass, the way we think about God. Right? In our modern age, too many times we think of God as just like our buddy or our friend, and we forget His majesty, His glory, His power, right? and our immense unworthiness of even receiving Him. The immense unworthiness of having the gift of the Church, the Mass, the sacraments, and primarily of Holy Communion. We should be struck with awe and trembling every time we come to Mass, every time we enter into His presence. Thanks be to God, He makes us worthy of His presence, particularly in Holy Communion.